No, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> She's mixing it up. All right. Thank you, Paula. You're awesome as always. Hey, I want to say good morning. My name is Al. I'm the lead pastor at Compassion Christian. If this is your first time, uh, I do hope I get a chance to meet you today. I'd love to just make a connection and say hello. At the very least, I want to say good morning to our members, our regular attenders, and especially our first-time guests. Take a few moments, if you're a first-timer, to let us know about you being here. Uh, you can find a connect card on the inside of your worship folder. That will be your ticket to something that you're going to want to take advantage of. If you'll fill this card out and let us know about your time here today, let us know about you, uh, and then you turn it in at the Connecting Point lobby, we'll give you a $5 Starbucks gift card, and that's our way of saying thank you for being here. We hope that today has been, uh, will be an experience where you've been warmly welcomed, where you feel like you're, uh, you've are you received some encouragement for the beginning of your week today, and so we hope that you'll, you'll jump in uh, and do that for us and do that uh, just as our way of saying thank you. So today I want you to take your, uh, take your message notes and I want you to take your Bibles and uh, we're going to be looking at the, the Old Testament book of Habakkuk here in just a moment and you're probably wondering where in the world is that even. Uh, just take a few moments to find that in your table of contents like I had to do this week uh, so you can, you can uh, find that and, and we'll be there in just a few moments. Um, today I want to talk about a topic that I think hits all of us. Uh, it's the topic of grief and hope. It's the topic of when we go through times of loss and tragedy, how we find hope on the other side of that. And I don't know everybody in the room today, but I would imagine in any type of group that I would speak to, there are people in this room who have been through grief, you've been through loss and struggle, and you're wondering how you're going to get through it. And you know, it isn't just something that we go through as adults, it's something that faces, I think, young adults. In fact, I, I read this week uh, a survey of a study that was done within like an eight year window that ended in 2017, and it actually showed that there is an explosion of depression and hopelessness among the youth of our culture, the youth of our society. Probably even people in this room have been through this. This new analysis of this larger representative survey shows us that the epidemic of mental health issues is real. In fact, there is an increase in mental health issues among teens and adults, young adults. That's nothing short of staggering when you really think about it. Uh, they, they studied this and they said from 2009 to 2017 was when they, they did the survey and they found that major depression in 20 to 21 year olds was was, uh, had more than doubled during that time. Uh, they also found that depression so, uh, surged 69% between 16 and 17 year olds and serious psychological distress, which included feelings of anxiety and hopelessness, jumped 71% in an 18 to 25 year old demographic. And, you know, we're thinking, why are our kids going through these things? Why is there so much hopelessness and depression and anxiety? It's because uh, of their things that are going on that our kids are seeing that they're not equipped to see, that they're not equipped to deal with, that they're not equipped to go through and handle. And, and there are a lot of different factors that play into this, but I want you to understand that it is an epidemic that is happening in our world. In fact, twice as many 22 to 23 year olds attempt suicide in 2017 compared to about eight years earlier. And so why is that? I, I believe that, that oftentimes when, te uh, when, when people get into their, their early 20s, they're around 22 or 23, maybe they're finishing up their college experience and they're getting ready to launch into their career and there is this feeling of a lack of direction. There's a feeling where things are out of control. Maybe they're facing enormous, overwhelming debt that they wonder if they can ever pay back in their lifetime. Or they're going through psychological issues that have, that have come as the, as the result of the stress and the trauma. Oftentimes it's when kids leave home and they, they leave the nest. That is when parents who have been married for all these years suddenly find out as they're empty nesters they have nothing in common and that is usually when they divorce after the kids get out of the house. And so these, these effects are happening. Studies have shown where this mental health crisis is taking place and as a church we should not 
bury our heads in the sand and just say, well, all you need to do is pray about it a little bit more. All you need to do is have a little bit more faith and you'll get through it. We need to come alongside with understanding and support and resources to be there for people who are going through mental uh, and emotional stress that leads them to the feelings of hopelessness and depression. And so, you know, we're wondering maybe today, why are we talking about this? Well, because in our culture, the way we handle this, the way we get through this is we we say let's take more medicine or let's uh, let's let's get involved in uh, ways that we we dull our senses and we dull the things that we're going through through chemical dependency and addiction and that's how we we get through it uh, other people say well if you just get involved in in working or exercising it's going to help and you know what all of those things are helpful to a point all of those things are they they all have their place in the healing but i believe that they're not enough I believe that something different has to be offered for people to get through these, these feelings and this, this pandemic of emotional distress that we see going on in our world. What I think we need to do today is talk about hope. And we need to find out what is hope really, what is, what is the, the, the hope that we have in the midst of the grief that we might find ourselves in, the grief that we might be experiencing today. And so I want to talk about that hope. And the reason I'm confident that there's something that everybody in this room can learn about today and, and take home with them is that there are 150 references in the Bible to hope. That over and over again, God is called the God of hope. There are prayers in the scriptures by those who wrote the word of God that those who would read the Bible would be filled with all joy and peace as we trust in God so that we may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So it is entirely possible for you today to find a source of hope that you, maybe you did not have when you came in here. There is a, there's a way and it is possible for you to restore and renew and revive the hope that you once had that has been lost because of life's circumstances. And so any discussion of hope today begins with God. It begins with who God is. And a major cause, I think, of hopelessness among people who follow Jesus and who believe in Jesus is the fact that, that we have a misunderstanding of what biblical hope really is. We don't understand it to, its, to, the, to the place where it, it becomes a part of our lives. You know, a lot of times we think of hope as something like a future thing that we're going to see. It's a, it's a promise of something that's going to happen in the future, maybe one day, but it's just not going to happen right now. We think hope is available to me after I die, but it's not something that I can live in or trust in right now. And we often think about hope as those benefits that are merely in the future. And so that is why this morning I want you to consider this idea that, that really will, will be the focus of what I'm talking about. And the, the idea is that hope is not just for the future, it's for now. Hope is not just for the future it's actually for now. It's not about what, what may happen. It's about what can happen. It's, about what, it's based on what God has done. And some of you need to hear that word today. And so as we go through grief, we need hope the most, right? And there is a passage of, uh, of Scripture that I want to show you, in fact, several places from a book in the Bible that we very rarely turn to that, that I think is going to show us where hope can be found. And then I want to take some ideas and some clips from a, a popular movie Movie to illustrate and bolster my arguments today so that we may come away with grief uh, that, that is overcome by hope. The grief that you're in today can be overcome and eventually encompassed by the hope that you have. Now, we're in week number three of our series called At the Movies, Faith on Film. And what we're doing is we're taking ideas from popular movies that, that we know and love. And uh, we're trying to find truth out of those things. And if you've missed previous weeks, you can go to our church website, CompassionDelaware.org. You can find us on YouTube. A YouTube channel, Compassion Delaware. You can find us on Facebook and you can see a video replay of all the sermons we've done through these past few weeks. But I've invited you this morning to turn in your Bibles to the Old Testament book of Habakkuk. I want you to know that I this week had to find Habakkuk in the table of contents in my Bible. 
I was thinking, you know, I memorized these, these, ver- these Bible uh, books, Old Testament and New Testament, years ago, but for some reason I could not bring to mind, and I was trying to test myself, where is the book of Habakkuk? I finally had to turn to the table of contents. So if you had to do that today, there's no shame in your game. Don't worry about that. Uh, I did as well. So I, wanted, I, I want you to, to find that because we don't often look to this place for our devotional reading. We don't often look to the book of Habakkuk because we well, that's the Old Testament. That's the Old Covenant. That's, you know, that's the past, and now the, you know, what I need to read is in the Old Testament. Actually, uh, the New Testament, rather. But I'm telling you, there is something here today for somebody, and God has you here for a particular reason. Now, as you have the book of Habakkuk in front of you, let me give you some context. Habakkuk lived and prophesied around 600 years uh, before Christ and at a time when things were unraveling in his own country. And that had a way of really weighing on him. In fact, his homeland was being led by a series of morally corrupt leaders. Uh, and, and so, you know, we know that that is a, a reality in just about any country, right? Right. And to make matters worse, drought had devastated their land to the point where they had, they had no fruit, no vegetables, nothing was bearing fruit. Their cows had either starved to death or had been stolen. And all of these bad things are going on. And then you pile insult to injury. And there was a country, a nation called the Babylonians, that were going to invade and uh, pillage and take captive all these Israelites that they did not kill and Habakkuk is watching all of this going on in his country, and it's affecting him not only at the national level, it's affecting him at the personal level, and he's going through all of these turmoil, uh, upheavals and turmoil in his life, and so he's witnessing this grief per- firsthand for himself, and he's asking God, God, how are you letting this happen? God, how am I going to make it through this? God, how am I going to face the realities that I'm dealing with? And that could be the question that you come in with today as well. It could be where you are right now. How am I going to make it through my current situation? Maybe today you're facing a tough medical diagnosis or a crumbling marriage or a financial difficulty. Maybe you have a relationship that's just ended and you have no prospects of reconciliation for the future. Maybe It's even more than that. You've lost someone to death, someone that you love dearly, and that's happened recently, and you're trying to figure out how you deal with that. So the Word of God today has something for you. So I want you to take your message notes, and we're going to kind of work through this together. And uh, the very first thing I want you to write down and fill in is going to be something that's probably patently obvious to everybody in the room, but just bear with me. It is this. The effects of grief can be devastating. We don't often realize it because depending on our personal makeup, our personality, depending on how we've been raised, uh, we all handle grief in different ways. Some people decide, I'm going to put on a brave face, I'm going to smile, I'm going to laugh, I'm going to stuff it down, I'm going to keep a stiff upper lip, and I'm not going to allow anyone to see me grieve and mourn and go through this. I'm going to deal with it privately. Others, are uh, they, they try to find a group of people that will support them, and they try to share that burden, and it seems like they, they, don't, get, they don't get much relief from that. It doesn't matter wh- how you deal with grief. All of us are going to deal with grief in our own certain way, but grief is this power powerful emotion that has no end date, it seems, when you first have it come on you. It has no timetable of when you're going to be done. It's like a a hurricane that has stalled out over a, a small barrier island, and the winds and the rain and the waves are just pelting this island, and that's how we often feel when we're going through grief. We feel like there's nothing I can do to get out from under this cloud. There's nothing I can do to to go through this. And so what happens when we're going through grief are these devastating consequences and devastating responses. And one of those things is that there are oftentimes unanswered questions when we're going through grief. Like, why did this happen? Why didn't God prevent it? What could I have done differently? Why is it the way that it is? You see, I want you to listen to the opening statement of Habakkuk in chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, and see if this sounds like uh, something similar to what maybe you've said before. He says this, How long, Lord, must I call for, for help, but you do not listen? I cry out to you, violence, but you do not save. Why do you make me look at Justice. Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflicts abound. 
So maybe you've, you've wondered before in, in, in the recent days, God, are you listening? Are you watching? Are you seeing what I'm going through in this life? Are you here? Are you idly watching me as I suffer and as I go through the trials? And, and God, are you not intervening? You see, for Habakkuk, in his case, he was wondering, God, why are you allowing the Babylonians, who are an evil, corrupt country and nation, to come in and, and have their way with us? Why are you allowing them to attack us, your chosen ones? Why are you allowing this to happen? And, you know, sometimes we think of ourselves that way as well. God, why are you allowing me to go through the trials that I'm facing? Why are you taking the people? away from me? Why are you uh, not just standing back while relationships that I love and cherish are being taken away from me? You see, Habakkuk was wondering, God, why is this going on? And you know, sometimes those questions that we ask don't always get an answer. They're unanswered questions. And we wonder why. We wonder why it's happening. But I want you to understand that the, the, this book is in your Bible, not just so you'll have a hard time finding it and have to go to the table of contents. It's here because it contains truth. And every book of the Bible, every chapter of the Bible, maybe not every chapter, but every book of the Bible contains some way where we can look at it and know about Jesus where we can find hope and faith in Jesus. So mark my words, if you're wondering, what can I get out of this book today? I hope to change your mind on that. So these questions are here because God wants us to, to wrestle with this. In fact, here's what I believe. One of the ways that God uh, takes you to deeper faith is through your doubts. And that's one of those other uh, very devastating effects of grief sometimes, and that's doubt. You know, sometimes... The grief that we go through causes us, because we don't have our questions answered, it causes us to doubt. We're like, I'm not really sure if I believe in God. I'm not really sure if I believe in everything the Bible says. I'm not really sure that I can sing the words to those songs and, and really mean it. Because it does seem like God is letting me down. It does seem like God has not moved the mountains for me. And so there are times when doubt is something that, that, is, that is okay for us to go through. And I cannot get over how uncomfortably candid Habakkuk is. Like he's asking these questions of God and it's almost like, are you allowed to say that to God? Like, like how did this miss the editorial spot of the Bible that this stayed in the Bible? How did this get to stay here? Are we allowed to say that? And here's what I think we learn. It's there not by mistake. And it's also there because we learn the lesson that it's okay to ask God the difficult questions. It's okay when, when you go through doubts. Doubt is often one of those tools that God will use to drive us deeper into faith. Faith that has not been tested by doubt can be shallow and fragile. And maybe your faith hasn't been tested yet. And maybe you're, you're going to get through it. Well, you can go through that and, and you can still come out on the other side even through your doubts. Maybe you can relate to that this morning. Maybe today you're currently in the midst of grief and hope. And you know, there are so many themes I could have chosen from the, the movie that we're featuring today as a, in our illustrations and clips, uh, but I chose today the movie Avengers Endgame. Anybody seen that movie, Avengers Endgame? Okay, not all of you have seen it, and so I'm going to spoil some of it for you today, and that's all right, uh, but it's your fault. It's been out since uh, the spring, so, um, but if you're unfamiliar or uninterested in the plot, let me just tell you what it is. Avengers is a superhero movie franchise, and so, you know, everybody looks for superheroes, so maybe you grew up with the, you know, the basic superheroes, Superman, Batman, Spider-Man, ones like that, but so now it's become this multi, probably billion dollar franchise, but uh, in the movie Endgame, uh, l let me just give you a brief synopsis of what's happening here. So in the movie, there is this super powerful villain named Thanos. Uh, Thanos, uh, And actually, Thanos is, the, uh, is derived from the Greek word for death. We should keep that in mind, the Greek word for death. So Thanos is this extremely powerful supervillain, and he has successfully eliminated half of the world's population just through the snap of his finger while wearing a devastating weapon called the Infinity Gauntlet. So not only does he eliminate half of the world's population, he also, in the process, eliminates many of the world's superheroes. The superheroes, you know, are the ones who protect the world from evil threats. And now now the ranks have been thinned out and the world is falling apart. So the most recent movie in this franchise, Endgame, picks up after the snap, as it's called, and everyone in the movie has lost friends and family that they love and the effects are devastating and everybody's dealing with it, including superheroes. 
So in this, in this clip that I'm going to show you, uh, you're going to see the results of a man named Scott Lang. He is known as Ant-Man. Now, again, you've got to use your imagination. It is, it is fantasy, right? But Ant-Man has been trapped in time, and he has been trapped there in time travel, and he's trying to reverse all the things that have happened. But he finally gets out of the space-time continuum, and he discovers what has happened when Thanos snapped his finger and half of the world's population vanished. They died. They were gone. And he makes a startling discovery as he goes and visits a memorial to all of those who have vanished. And he, there he makes some startling discoveries. So let's watch this clip. <laughs> if you've seen you know that everybody's trying to cope everybody's trying to deal with their loss some of them are throwing themselves into into continuing the work of the avengers others in this uh, movie others of the superheroes are hunting the world's criminals avenging this moral imbalance that uh, of the fact that gangsters and random thugs have escaped and survived the snap. Captain America, the most popular probably of all the Avengers besides Iron Man, tries to utilize his optimism in support groups to keep the morale up. And all of a sudden, Scott Lang realizes that, that he's been out of it. He, has, he, he did not know this had happened. And for a moment, he was overcome by grief. He was overcome by the grief that he had maybe lost his daughter. And then he dis discovered that he was also pronounced dead or thought to be lost. And he comes back into a world devastated by grief. And as you can see, even as it's depicted, that there are tough realities that we deal with when we've lost loved ones, when we've lost relationships, when we've lost maybe our ability to do for ourselves. And, and grief comes in all types of forms. But it is the hope that we find that is a power that will give you strength not only in the tragic moments of life, but actually will infuse you with, with the strength of God to get through the things that are maybe not as difficult. So my purpose today is to give you hope. My purpose is to point you to the scriptures and get you to see that there is a hope that we have through the Lord. And so back to the scripture uh, that, that we, we just read, Habakkuk is asking God all of these very difficult questions, all of the questions maybe that we've asked before. And sometimes in the midst of grief, we think, you know, God is not just. God is not fair. God is not loving. God is not all-powerful. Because if he was, he would stop everything from happening to me. He would stop everything from happening in the world. And you know, this is not a new question for us. In fact, this goes back as far as biblical times. But we probably most frequently hear about this through what we call the problem of pain and the problem of evil. And it's, it actually began back in the 5th century with a Greek philosopher named Epicurus. 
He was, a, he was a skeptic. And he said, basically, his argument was, if God is really all-powerful, he could stop evil. And if God is really loving, he would want to stop it all. So the fact that pain and suffering and injustice run rampant in our world, that means that God is not here, and God is not powerful, and God is not just. That is an age-old problem. See here that Habakkuk framed that question before Epicurus did. But he asked a question. He asked a question, and then, in his case, he got an answer. I want you to look in your Bibles at Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 5. That's where we're going to go first. Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 5. If you look up on the screen, the verses are up there as well. And this is the answer that God gave Habakkuk about the problem of evil. God, why is this happening in my life? Habakkuk receives this. Look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed, for I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe even if you were told. So what he's saying is, is that you don't see everything that I see. You don't understand everything that I, that I know. And so God says, you need to look and realize that, I, that I'm going to do something. I'm going to bring something out of this that you would never have imagined. And so through this book, what Habakkuk does is he keeps lodging his complaints and his questions toward God. He says, God, okay, what about this? Why are you not answering here? And then I love what he says. He shows some resolve in chapter 2, verse 1. Look, at, look up on the screen. It says this. It says, I will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. In other words, I will, I will go up into the watchtower, God, and I will look to see what he will say to me, you, God, and what answer I am to give to this complaint. He's saying, I'm going to dig in my heels. I'm going to wait. And so what God does is God answers him over and over again. Habakkuk will argue a little bit more with God. Okay, God, well, what about this? God gives him another answer, and this process goes through, and finally, Habakkuk is humbled by the answers God gives him. But I want you to know that in Habakkuk's time, through the invasion of the Babylonians, that God was setting up a situation that would clearly display the saving work that he was going to do in their lives. In fact, it was beyond anything he could understand at the, at the moment. In fact, if you look down in verse 14 of chapter 2, he says this to Habakkuk. He says, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So in other words, the bigger thing God was doing was he was expanding the knowledge of his glory through the suffering of the, uh, at the hands of the Babylonians, which meant that this turn of events was going to result in more people turning to God out of desperation because they needed him. Now, God could have stopped the Babylonian captivity. God could have stopped that, but he said, you know what? I'm going, to, I'm going to allow this to happen, and I'm going to allow you to turn back to me so that you will see that I will rescue you and be your rescuer. And so in the end, Habakkuk is able to work through his grief, and of course it took time. But what he says next in chapter 3, I think could be transformative for someone today. Now, I want you to turn in your Bibles to Habakkuk chapter 3, and we're going to look at some verses there. But before you, while you're doing that, rather, why don't you write this down in your message notes? Joyful hope is what will transform grief. Joyful hope will transform grief, and it will take time. It will be a process. But over the next few verses, Habakkuk really recounts the story of God and his faithfulness in the past. And in the process, he gives us an idea of steps that we can take when we are overcome by grief and we're asking God the hard questions that don't have answers and when we're going through doubt. So I want you to look at what, what's going to uh, appear up on the screen. Here's what it says. Lord, I have heard of your ways. I've heard of your fame. I stand in all of your deeds, Lord. Repeat them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. God came from Teman, the Holy One from Mount Paran. His glory covered the heavens and His praise filled the earth. His splendor was like the sunrise. Rays flashed from His hand where His power was hidden. Now look at the next verse and see if it doesn't remind you of something that happened in the book of Exodus. Plague went before him, and pestilence followed his steps. He's remembering the exodus from Egyptian captivity. He stood and shook the earth. He looked and made the mountains, tr the nations tremble. The ancient mountains crumbled, and the age-old hills collapsed. But he marches on forever. 
I saw the tents of Kushan in distress, the dwellings of Midian in anguish. Were you angry with the rivers, Lord? Was your wrath against the streams? Did you rage against the sea when you rode your horses and your chariots to victory? You uncovered your bow. You called for many arrows. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains you saw, the mountains saw you and writhed. Torrents of water swept by, and the deep roared, and lifted its waves on high. Sun and moon stood still in the heavens, at the glint of your flying arrows, at the lightning of your flashing spear. In wrath you strode through the earth, and in anger you threshed the nations. You came out to deliver your people, to save your anointed one. You crushed the leader of the land of wickedness. You stripped him from head to foot. With his own spear, you pierced his head when his warriors stormed out to scatter us, gloating as though about to devour the wretched who were in hiding. You trampled the sea with your horses, churning the great waters. Remember when God brought down the sea on the Egyptian soldiers? And so Habakkuk is saying, God, I I remember what I've read about. I remember what I've heard that you've done in the past. And all of a sudden, things started to change for him when he heard from the Lord and he received this infusion of hope. And that's what we need. We need the very same hope that comes to us when all seems lost, when all seems like it's not going our way and it's not going to change. And to illustrate this, I want to show you the, uh, the second clip from the Avengers movie. Now, in, in this clip, you're going to see that uh, Natasha and Steve, who are known as Black Widow and Captain America, they are still lingering in their grief. They're trying to figure out, how are we going to make this? How are we going to move on? And all of a sudden, when it seems like there's no hope to be found, all of a sudden, Scott Lang, who you just saw in the, in the first clip, uh, appears with an idea that's going to give them hope once again. Let's watch. You know, I'd offer to cook you dinner, but you seem pretty miserable already. Are you here to do your laundry? And to see a friend. Clearly your friend is fine. You know, I saw a pot of whales when I was coming over the bridge. In the Hudson? It's fewer ships, cleaner water. You know, if you're about to tell me to look on the bright side, um... I'm about to hit you in the head with a peanut butter sandwich. Hmm. Sorry. Of course I have it. You know, I keep telling everybody they should move on and grow. Some do. not us. If I move on, who does this? Maybe it doesn't need to be done. I used to have nothing. And then I got this. This job. This family. And I was... Is better because of it. And even though you're gone, I'm still trying to be better. I think we both need to get alive. You first. If you've seen the movie, you know that's a turning point. All of a sudden, in their grief, there's hope. All of a sudden, things change. And, and I don't know where you and I think we, we can get our hope when we're in the midst of grief. But I want to offer some things that I see in the passage that Habakkuk did that I think we can do as well. And the first way that we, we get hope that can overcome our grief is that we, we do it by recalling the past. By looking back on what God has done in history, what God has done 
through the Word of God, what God has done in our own lives, and, and repeat that and rehearse that. And you know, the thing I love about the Scripture is that the Bible never really gives you the important concepts just one time and then leaves it at that. The Bible actually repeats the important things over and over and over again. That's why parents are always telling their kids the important things over and over and over again. You get tired of hearing it, right? Brush your teeth, make your bed, little things, right? Be kind towards each other. Trust God. Why? Because we need to hear these things over and over and over and over again. It's because when we do that, when we dwell in what God has done in the past, we have a hope of what God will do in our current situation and in our future. So your spiritual health is directly correlated to how many times and how often you review the benefits of your salvation. That's why the psalmist said, praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Don't forget what God has done. You see, your spiritual health is going, to be, is going to be bolstered by remembering what God has done. Now, you may get thoughts and ideas and encouragement from a sermon, but my sermon is only going to last you probably half a day at the least, maybe a, a day or two into the week. It is when you start remembering what God has done in your past that you will be you'll be brought back to, to this reality that, you know what, God is faithful. God has been there for me. Because when life saps you of your strength, you need to force yourself to remember and repeat and wrestle with God until he reveals himself and his glory to you. I and mean, maybe we need to do just like Habakkuk did. What did Habakkuk say? He's asking all these questions and he said, okay, so I'm going to get up in my watchtower and I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait on you, Lord. I'm going to wait until I'm reminded uh, again of who you are. And that's what we need to do is be relentless and, and tenacious and stay at the place in the, in, before God so that we can remember what God has done and what he will do. He had, we, Habakkuk had to recall the ways that God had been faithful. And, and, and we can do that very same thing and take confidence in God's ability and willingness to do it again. Friends, if you've not felt like you've met God in years, if you don't feel like you've had a fresh encounter with the Lord, I would encourage you to begin in that place today. That place where you sit and you get silent before God and say, God, remind me. Remind me of, of what you've done in the past. That's the first way. The second way that we can get this hope is by relying on the strength of God. Relying on, on him and say, God, you're the only one who can move this mountain. You're the only one who can see me through. That's why I love what the last part of Habakkuk says in chapter 3, verse 19. Here's what it says. He says, the sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. So this, this idea is this picture of a deer who's on the heights which is usually the safest place to get, right? Because you're, you're safe from the attack of the enemy. You can see from all vantage points. And if you've ever seen a deer on the side of a mountain or on a cliff, you know that their, their feet are sure and steady and nimble enough to get them around. And so what he's saying is when your hope and your strength is in the Lord, you are like that deer. You are sure-footed even when, when trials and pain and grief overtake you, that you are there and you're, you're prevailing above it because your strength and your faith and your hope is in the Lord. That is where God wants to take you. And frequently it happens through our deepest, darkest times. There are times that, uh, that you will only know about God when you are empty and when you're broken and when you're feeling alone. That is when hope is going to be restored. Now, I mentioned earlier that the great villain of the Avengers movies is Thanos, the word, the derivative of the word death. And eventually, though, he has to be defeated. He has to be defeated by someone who makes a tremendous sacrifice where death is defeated by a sacrifice. And that sounds familiar to those of you who know the story of the gospel. But I want you to see this last clip, and I want you to see what happens after the one who made the sacrifice is now speaking to those who, who, whom he loves in a, in a pre-recorded message. Spoiler alert, he dies. Here you go. Thank you. 
everybody wants a happy ending, right? But it doesn't always roll that way. Maybe this time. I'm hoping if you play this back, it's in celebration. I hope families are reunited. I hope we get it back in something like a normal version of the planet has been restored. If there ever was such a thing. God, what a world. Universe. If you told me 10 years ago that we weren't alone, let alone, you know, to this extent, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't have been surprised, but come on, new. The epic forces of darkness and light that have come into play. And for better or worse, that's the reality Morgan's going to have to find a way to grow up in. So I thought I'd probably better record a little greeting in the case of an untimely death on my heart. I mean, not that death at any time isn't untimely. This time travel thing that we're going to try and pull off tomorrow, it's, it's, it's got me scratching my head about the survivability of this thing. And again, that's the hero gig. Part of the journey is the end. What am I even tripping for? Everything's going to work out exactly the way it's supposed to. I love you 3,000. Our hope comes from one who defeated death, and in the end, he gives us hope. And when you understand that, you can rejoice that in Christ... Through faith, you possess something better than anything life can give and more secure than anything that death can take away. It's the hope that we have in Jesus. And if you don't have that hope, uh, I, my prayer is that today you'll find it. Let's pray together. Father, today we want to close by understanding that hope is a choice. Lord Habakkuk later said that he would rejoice. He said, I will rejoice. That is a language of choice which is why we're commanded in Scripture to rejoice in the Lord always. And so, God, I pray that we'll understand that it's not about the result of what we're feeling. It's based on the fact that you have died on the cross to take our shame and our guilt and our pain, and you've helped us to solve the riddle of death. You've helped us to, to understand that when we pass from this earth, if we know you and we've accepted you and we've received you as Savior, death is just but a, a transition into a, the, the presence of our Lord and Savior. And Lord, death is also a transition into the presence of suffering and torment for those who don't know you. So God, I pray that we would be found on the, the right side today, the right side of eternity, the right side of this hope that we're struggling to find Lord, I pray that someone today would, would find that hope in you and they would trust in you, Lord, for their salvation. Thank you, Father, for the ability to listen and, and take lessons from our culture and see how the Word of God addresses it. God, I pray that we would rejoice in our hope today. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Maybe today somebody's going to find that hope. Maybe today somebody, that someone is you where you're going to say, yeah.